Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Assembly Lines Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Torrance, and today I'm really excited to be able to talk to Mark Lemmert of 6502 Workshop. Mark and his team have been working hard on a new RPG game for the Apple II called Nox Archaist, and we'll talk to Mark about the game and about his Kickstarter. So let's get started. Welcome to another Assembly Lines podcast. I'm your host, Chris Torrance, and today I have a special guest with me. It's Mark Lemmert of 6502 Workshop, and he's going to tell us all about his brand new Apple II game. So welcome, Mark. Well, thanks, Chris. I appreciate your having me on today. Uh, really looking forward to uh, talking with you and, uh, and with your viewers. Um, as you mentioned, uh, uh, 6502 Workshop uh, has a new Apple II game in the works, Nox Archaist, and uh, it is a uh, sword and sorcery uh, tile-based game. Uh, players of Nox Archaist will explore a robust uh, storyline within a non-linear world containing numerous castles, towns, uh, dungeons, and uh, NPCs. And uh, it will also be a skills-driven character development and uh, strategic turn-based combat scenario uh, type of game uh, that uh, you know integrates the game storyline within it uh, to hopefully you know kind of keep it interesting and engaging for the player uh, as they go. You know, people like combat. Well, you know, they'll get plenty of that. People like to focus more on the story. They'll absolutely get that. And uh, you know, the 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 art I think is kind of weaving the two together, and that's that's really what we're trying to do. Uh, as well as, uh, you know, really push the frontier in uh, Apple II uh, game development. Uh, as, uh, you know, I like to think of it, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of giants uh, from, from the 80s, and, and we're trying to put ourselves in their shoes and uh, trying to do what we think they might have done if game development had continued on the Apple II uh, platform past uh, the end of the 80s, like if the Mac and PC revolution had just kind of been delayed for, you know, five, ten years or something, what would they would have been done? We're finding there's a lot of the machine left that, that, that didn't get tapped, uh, and uh, we're, we're doing our best to, to tap that. So uh, we're, we're pretty excited about that. And, um, you know, we're also hoping in, the, you know, in doing this project to encourage uh, others to develop Apple II uh, RPG games. Uh, you know, we'd really like to play some. <laughs> I mean, I guess this is, you know, when you were saying it carried on from the games of the 80s. I mean, you're kind of talking maybe something like Ultima, those type of games. Is that right? And so... What if you had to say, like, what are the few things where, you know, like if, if game development had continued, which actually that's kind of what you're doing, uh, what, what are some things in Nox Archaeus that you think are kind of new and cutting edge uh, that could have been done back then, but obviously didn't get done and now you're doing? Sure, sure. That, that's a great question. And yeah, absolutely. Ultima, you know, as, as uh, most people know, you kind of launched the genre of uh, computer gaming, uh, certainly fantasy gaming, and definitely tile-based RPGs. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, there were many other tile RPGs as well uh, that, uh, uh, you know, followed suit. And, and uh, I think off the top of my head, uh, some others, notable ones were Death Lord and uh, Wrath of Death and Or, a whole, whole bunch of them. And, and you know, some, some were really great too. And, uh, you know, so yeah, we're, we're kind of aiming for, for that, you know, sort of tile-based genre. Uh, but also looking at it more broadly, uh, you know, thinking of games like Wizardry and Bard's Tale, they had some really unique elements too. Particularly the humor in Bard's Tale was something that I always liked. And uh, so uh, Nox Archaeist, uh, you know, it's going to be a fairly dark and, and serious game on a lot of levels. But uh, you know, every now and in there, you know, there will be something, you know, kind of funny that that, that, that just pops out. So uh, we'll try to do a little of that too. But uh, to your to your question about uh, uh, what are some of those things, well. Um, something really obvious uh, that, that will be seen right away that gets right into the foundation of the, uh, the game engine is uh, the uh, uh, player will be looking at almost a full screen view. And the tile games of the 80s almost exclusively uh, used maybe half or even a third of the screen on kind of on the left side and then on the right side of the screen you'd have your character stats and 
a scrolling text window. And uh, we, we went almost full screen with it, you know, just reserving a couple columns on the right hand side, really, for a small little amount of text. Uh, but uh, that's uh, going to stand right out. And essentially, what the way we manage it is far as like, well, obviously, we have to put certain information on the screen, like the character roster, is it's done with pop-up windows. And, you know, it, it was an interesting, this is one of the most interesting aspects of the development process, is as we're coming up with ideas, you know, we sort of have to go through a process of, okay, this wasn't done before. Why wasn't it done before? Was it a technical reason? Um, you know, was it a preferential choice of design reason? You know, what were, were there good reasons or they ever treated all those sorts of things? Uh, because certainly, uh, you know, those guys knew what they were doing, and you know, we don't want to just you know plow into a dead end. You know, essentially, that's a, 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 you know, of course, a huge risk in in development. Um, and what I can concluded, and, and we have this working as has been seen in our gameplay videos, including uh, our presentation at Kansas Fest, you know, we have the pop-up windows working. It's done. It's been proven out. And so now looking back on it, um, you know, I, I think what it comes down to is in the 1980s, it could have been done. But if we think back to computing at that time, pop-up windows just really wasn't a concept. And so now, you know, this is an exercise in taking the influence of the modern uh, computer world in games and... Uh, kind of taking the best parts and 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 applying them within the 8-bit world. You know, in Oxford absolutely, it's going to feel like that classic 8-bit, you know, RPG game uh, and these little bits and pieces that we're picking out of, you know, more, the more modern world to supplant in. Uh, we think they're, they're, they're just going to make the experience better because they're going to make the user interface less clunky or they're going to do things like, wow, now suddenly you're seeing almost the whole screen instead of having, you know, two-thirds of it dedicated to, you know, some text. Um, so that, that's one of my favorite ones that, that came right in the beginning. And, uh, it, it was, uh, I remember kind of that leap of faith moment of like, okay, we're going to try this. I don't know if this is going to work. But, you know? <laughs> and it starts to get locked in, you know, you, you start dividing the screen size and building everything around it. So, and so, you know, you, you keep seeing we and our and everything like this. So clearly this is not just a, a, a one person effort. Um, so maybe t uh, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, your team that you have working on this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the uh, Knox Archaeus team started out as two people, uh, myself and my project co-founder, Mike Reimer. Uh, and and uh, he and I go way back to uh, basically we grew up across the street from each other as kids and playing games in the 80s. And, you know, we would sit there and play you know, the Ultimas, uh, on, on, like on the, we're on the computer and we're like on the phone talking to each other half the time, even though we lived across the street, tying up our parents' phone lines, you know, it just drove them crazy. But, you know, that was, uh, uh, that, that, that was just a really fun experience that we had as kids and, 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 you know, in modern day getting back into, you know, the Apple II and, and gaming, there was a point where we're just like, you know, we really need some more 8-bit Apple II games. Let's make the one that, you know, we always, uh, wished that, you know, we had, so to speak, um, and, uh, and and then it just kind of snowballed from there. Uh, we're, we have grown to a team of eight uh, in total. Uh, we also have uh, Bill Geege and uh, Robert Padavan on the team. Uh, they're uh, professional graphics animators in the movie industry, and uh, they're designing most of the 8-bit uh, uh, game art. And uh, actually, if you check them out on IMDb, you'll see some uh, animated film titles that you might recognize from uh, years ago and, and uh, some mo uh, modern-day titles as well. Uh, Gordon uh, Mackey is doing our print artwork, uh, so things like the box cover and the manual, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's doing all, all of that uh, designing. Electric Moo does the uh, music overlay for our promo videos and is working on uh, tracks for an audio CD that will be available for the game, or with the game. Uh, Peter Ferry uh, is also on the team. Uh, he's focused on uh, Low-level programming, uh, such as file I.O. and uh, copy protection. Uh, and, of course, as most people know, Peter Ferry is also known as Cucumba, uh, Grandmaster uh, uh, Copy Protection Cracker and uh, Assembly Language Programmer. So we're, we're pretty pretty excited to have him on the team in general and when it comes to the prop copy protection to see him sort of switch sides for uh, a brief period and, and apply his skills in the other direction uh, is, is going to be really cool. And you know, I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, you know, how, how that plays out uh, with uh, uh, seeing the other folks in the community uh, take a crack at it. And <laughs> it should be fun to see. Um, 
And uh, Peter also helps me with some of the stickier debugging problems and uh, General 6502 uh, questions. And uh, he's, he's just been really awesome. Can't thank him enough for, uh, for his support. And uh, then additionally, uh, Elizabeth Daggert uh, is on the team as a project advisor. Uh, and uh, she may also be doing uh, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the game writing uh, at some point as well, something we talked about more recently. But uh, she has a lot of uh, experience in the vintage and modern gaming industry, uh, having worked on projects like uh, Load Runner Online uh, back in the day. Uh, and uh, she's, she's really helping us a lot to uh, try to see around corners and avoid uh, pitfalls. And uh, that's, that's helped a great deal. So we thank her and all the team members uh, uh, very much for everything that they've done and bringing the project to this point. So, uh, well, I, I think at this point, maybe we should actually show some uh, gameplay because I'm sure our uh, uh, viewers are going to uh, want to see what that looks like. So let's switch over and we'll uh, take a look at that. The first gameplay demo I have uh, to share today is a cool feature in Nox Archaeus Combat for players who really like to know what effect their weapons, armor, and character attributes have on uh, the damage and hit-miss dice rolls the game is doing behind the scenes. To help do this, the player can optionally enable a verbose mode in combat, which is toggled on and off with a key press. And using this mode is totally optional. The level of detail that this shows will not be necessary for the player to enjoy and ultimately win the game, and for players who are into stats, I think this will be a lot of fun. Uh, it can be challenging to keep up with the scroll text, so the player can use the plus and minus keys uh, to address the scroll text speed. Pausing and modifying the scroll text also slows down animation, so we recommend keeping the scroll text at max speed most of the time. So we'll go ahead and let the player characters and mobs uh, finish this battle themselves, and instead uh, we'll go have some fun exploring one of the realm's many towns. We start the next gameplay demo at the entrance to the town we first revealed in the Shattered Sword video released a while back, which told a short story through the game engine involving the town wizard. We're going to take a look at some other parts of the town today which haven't been seen. Say, the moon on that building looks like the mark of the Magus Guild. Let's go check it out. Maybe they have some magic items for sale. Oops. That's actually the outhouse. There must be a magic shop around here somewhere, though. Ah, here it is. Looks like the shop wizard is uh, busy mixing potions. And also researching his crystal ball. I bet he has some spell books for sale, too. But there are more things to check out, so we'll leave him to his work. We can see that the game engine's line of sight algorithm allows us to see inside the uh, left building a little bit because of the windows on the doors. We've shown NPC conversation several times, and uh, today we're going to show another feature. The NPC near the well is programmed to terminate the conversation with player 50% of the time. So let's check out how this has helped create this NPC's personality. Doesn't look like he's in the mood to talk, so uh, we'll leave him alone and come back another day. Just looking at the gameplay, it looked like, I mean, you were saying earlier that, you know, you want to kind of go for like a dark theme, but at the same time have some sort of humor in it. Um, and so that's a, that is a little bit different from some of the older games where I think they were all pretty serious. So uh, what what made you kind of decide to, to go down that route then to to have both the dark and the, the humor? Sure, sure. Um, it's, it's really a reflection, I think, of Mike and I's uh, personality and uh, where I tend to gravitate to in terms of um, the uh, my interest in, in, in games and gameplay uh, from from a uh, kind of a personality standpoint. Uh, you know, Mike and I are you know, we're, we're a bunch of goofballs, you know, we, you know, like Monty Python and Spaceballs and, you know, things like that. And, and we're just constantly, you know, kind of fooling around like that, you know, and and uh, it, it comes out in all aspects of life, including for me at, at Kansas Fest. And, you know, there's that, that tie competition and. Uh, you know, we all had those blue lanyards with our, our name tags and then, you know, room keys like on another thing. And, and uh, so at the, at the last minute, I decide, well, I don't think this has ever been done before. I've got this, you know, kind of, you know, 
name tag with the blue lanyard and I hung the room key off dangling down further and was like, hey, that's my tie. <laughs> I hope you give me some extra points because I came up with this in the last five seconds before the contest started and used nothing that I didn't already have on me. <laughs> Just random nonsense. And sometimes it's funnier than others. So I don't know how that one went over, but that was, uh, that was kind of a reflection of the personality there. Um, and uh, as far as the dark side of it goes, uh, that's kind of a reflection of, I don't know, as, as a kid growing up, uh, I, w I was somehow always, always intrigued by the, the villains. I was a big fan of, you know, Darth Vader, for example. Uh, I was rooting for him, you know, even, even before the end, you know, that's, a, or in, uh, you know, in, in, in books, uh, fantasy books and, and things like that. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you ever saw, read the Dragonlance series, but you know, Lord Soth, I was a, a big Lord Soth fan, you know, so it, it's just somehow the way I got wired and was always just intrigued by, uh, these, these super villains. And, uh, as, as a result of that, in, in terms of, you know, you know, creating the storyline and things like that, uh, I, I'm just imagining all these, you know, different ways to bring, you know, major dark villains into the mix and, and have them very center stage, not, you know, kind of off to the side. And uh, it'll still definitely be, you know, the hero is designed to overcome, you know, evil and all that, like pretty much all games are. And uh, how, how to mix humor in that is going to be a, uh, an interesting experiment. Uh, I'm, I'm confident that it can be done. And uh, if push comes to shove, uh, I think the dark theme would win out. You know, we're, we're not going to do, you know, the humor at the expense of the serious dark themed uh, game. But I, I think, again, I go back to Bard's Tale as a good example of, you know, how it was done. You know, what we're trying to do is probably a little bit darker than what Bard's Tale was. But all the same, you know, you know, it had the mad god Tarzan and things. And, you know, it wasn't it wasn't, you know, terribly you know, undark, and, and, and it was taken seriously as a game. Um, and yet every once in a while, you know, you'd run into things like a spell called Summon Herb. And I, I'm reading in the manual, what, Summon Herb? And it says, well, yeah, you know, Herb's a pretty busy guy, but he'll hang out with your party for a while if you really need him. You know? <laughs> uh, I thought, okay, I've seen a, 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 a case there where, where it was done, or at least done to some extent. So that's giving me confidence that there's got to be a way to do it uh, to, to, to strike that balance. So we're going to give it a try. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you have mentioned earlier, I think, that um, a couple of things like like rewards and, and and maybe, you know, box art and things like that. And so that actually brings me to a, a really big question is what uh, uh, you have a Kickstarter. Yes. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, Kickstarter is going to uh, uh, launch on September uh, 16th, which uh, is uh, when this video airs, it should be live. So please go check us out, kickstarter.noxorchaos.com. Uh, but uh, kind of how that evolved is since no announcing Nox or Chaos publicly uh, back in 2016, we received numerous requests for uh, a physical collector's edition of the game uh, of some sort. And um, we were really thrilled, you know, to hear that since uh, uh, opening up the game box, uh, you know, putting a fabric uh, map on the wall next to the computer and flipping through a handheld manual full of cool art is exactly the experience from uh, the 1980s that we remember and that we would like to revive. Uh, and, you know, just really that full full immersion. So we have uh, prototypes done of, uh, of many of the reward items, which uh, can give a sneak peek on here. This is the, the game box with uh, artwork by uh, Gordon Mackey, as, uh, as mentioned before. So hopefully the dark theme starts to radiate a little bit from this. <laughs> That's the, that was the hope, at least. And a printed manual. Uh, th this is just kind of a sample of the artwork and, you know, kind of the booklet style uh, that it will be. And we have a few, few sample pages throughout. And uh, fabric map. This is uh, actually printed on canvas. So it'll be uh, really, uh, I think, easier than cloth to, if you want to mount it on the wall, something like that. Um, and 
just uh, something I didn't have the opportunity to mention at, at Kansas Fest is what is seen here on, on the uh, prototype is not actually the final game world. Um, you know, we're, we're following uh, the development model of build the game engine with as many cool features as we can and then tell the best story that we can from the game engine. Uh, rather than contemplating, well, here's here's the game and the story. Now build the game engine to do it, uh, since that can you know you, you, you sort of back you in a corner where you have to shoehorn things in more because you're trying to force the game engine into a particular mode or, or, or a particular methods. So so as a result of that, when it came time to do the prototypes, it was like, okay, so what's the what's the map gonna look like? Well, we don't know yet. And uh, this I, I I thought what you know what he came up with here. This I thought this was actually a pretty cool map. So we may use parts of it. Uh, for sure. There will be a number of different collector's box editions, and the entry-level collector's box will have, well, the box, uh, the map, and the manual as seen, and uh, it'll also have uh, two art game artifacts. Uh, for example, this uh, crystal uh, is uh, what we uh, refer to as a crown jewel, and, you know, these will all have some gameplay tie-in, so one possibility uh you know, it may be this crown jewel might be a jewel from the crown uh, of uh, of this uh, this being. We also have uh, it'll be in the entry level collector's box. There's also going to be some some coins. Then some of the uh, uh, higher level box game box uh, tiers or, or collector's edition box tiers. Uh, we'll have a few other items. Like for example, we'll have a chainmail artifact. Um, there will be a writ from the king in a wax sealed envelope uh there's 20 limited edition limited kickstarter editions of the game that have numbered uh certificates um you know some of the uh, uh boxes uh, have in-game rewards uh, like for example uh the player will be able to uh pick an object in the game that they get to name name after themselves or whatever name that they want to use this would be things like waterfalls mountains uh dungeons villages uh Name your own weapon, you know, if, or, or shield if, uh, you know, you, you want to name, uh, you know, the shield or, or the weapon uh, after yourself, uh, you can. Or, or, or just to say, hey, there's this particular weapon that I really want to be in the game uh, and, and pick the name for it. Uh, and, and that applies with all, all of those in-game naming type rewards. Uh, very, very top tier uh, actually has a reward for owning your own uh, uh, pub or tavern. And uh, that one uh, will be, uh, there's only two of those available. And there's a couple of reasons there's only two. Uh, well, and one, of them, uh, one reason has to do with uh, limited availability on some of the other uh, reward items, but also in terms of the uh, uh, owning your own pub, uh, you know, that, that's going to take some resources in the game in order to, uh, to do that. And, and uh, you know, limiting it to two kind of, is partially resource management. Uh, but the, uh, the the plan is the bartender will acknowledge the uh, the the backer that that is the player uh, as being the owner of of the pub, uh, and uh, hopefully the plan is that there will be a private dining room uh, or party room that the player as the pub owner will have access to. This is obviously a uh, Apple II game, and you know I noticed you're going to have some uh, rewards where you can get uh, discs like floppy disks with it. But what about people that, say, don't have, uh, have access to the old hardware? Um, what can they do if they're only on a modern machine? Sure. Absolutely. We, we have uh, the tiers are set up so that there are uh, is Apple II versions uh, and then also a PC Mac uh, version uh, in, in these various reward tiers. And uh, the PC Mac version, uh, it will have the, uh, the game in, in disk images on a USB drive which then the player can uh, play in an emulator. Uh, and uh, the, the disk images will either have some really simple instructions on how to download an emulator, emulator and launch the disk images. The other possibility is uh, I, I, I might consider bundling emulators with the software uh, if that's allowed. Before I forget, where did the name come from? Ah, that, that is a great question. So uh, the name was the result of some brainstorming that Mike Reimer and I did over the course of uh, probably six months. Um, 
and 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 it, we we made the project public in March of 2016. And so the amount of time prior to that, uh, we were probably at working on it for eight months before that. And the game didn't have a name more or less for that entire time because we didn't really need one. And but at one point we're going to announce it. It's like okay, well we need a name. And and throughout that time, what we were doing is just kind of you know writing down you know things that you know we were thinking of. And and Mike in particular did a lot of research on. Uh, you know, just just basically cool words and synonyms of cool words, and so we just had these lists and lists and lists of 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 not not even complete names, just words, and like, can we put these together in a way that makes a cool name? And and so when when it came time to making you know really final decision, it, it was a process of looking. Okay, well, first of all, what's what's a cool sounding name? One that we can imagine uh, working in a storyline in a variety of different possible ways. Because we, we didn't know what the story was going to be at that point, so we didn't want to box into just one possible way. Uh, and then also a name that was, we wanted a name that was unique. Uh, so uh, that, for example, well, one, it would stand out, people would you know remember it. And then additionally, just in Google searching, so that if somebody searched for our name, they would find us and not, you know, 20 other things. And Knox Archaeist, we thought, you know, kind of checked all of those boxes uh, in, the, in the criteria. And uh, uh, that's... that's um, and what we finalized on in Knox, uh, as, as, as some people may know, is the Latin word for night or dark. Uh, Archaist is the study of old things. And we thought, okay, we got some night and dark in there, some old stuff in there. We, we can come up with a, a fantasy uh, sword and sorcery RPG wrapped around that, I think. You know, that, that seemed like a pretty safe bet. So uh, I, I've been having fun. As I was developing the game engine, you know, making lots of notes on possibilities on the storyline, not, you know, committing anything, you know, uh, to stone, uh, so to speak, but lot, lots of notes and ideas. And, you know, one, one of the uh, tracks of that was imagining, OK, so what exactly is Nox or Chaos? What, you know, that, 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 that's, uh, you know, that's that's a key uh, obviously, a very key, you know, question and decision, and and I and at this point, I'm pretty sure I know what it is, or who it is, or where it is, or who, what, where, how, and why. <laughs> I'm not, not going to give anything away there, but at this point, I'm pretty sure I know. Um, but uh, you know, won't make any final decisions until you know, sort of, it all comes together. All right, and one last question. And I hate to put you on the spot, but uh, release date? Uh, we are shooting for the end of 2018. And uh, that that's a target. You know, we're going to do our best. We're, we're all, uh, you, you know, as, as I'm sure you, you would guess or know, uh, you know, people that are doing this as a hobby. Uh, we have day jobs and et cetera. Uh, and nonetheless, are very, are very committed to it. I mean, this is pretty much in my life, you know, what what I, I do if I'm not working in my day job. I'm doing this. <laughs> I, I, I put every, all other hobbies on hold. Uh, and, uh, you know, just, you know, work hours and hours, you know, pretty much every day on this and love doing it. And uh, end of 2018, you know, that that's the target. And uh, whatever the date ends up being, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we absolutely, you know, are, are, are committed and everybody can you know feel confident uh, that, uh, you know, we're going to see it through and, and we'll be working very hard in, until it's done. Awesome. That's great. All right. Well, uh, anything else you want to add? Uh, yes, uh, I, I would just like to uh, thank uh, the Apple II community uh, very much for all the encouragement and, and support uh, throughout the project. I, I mean, this has really been an incredibly fun time and uh, uh, really, uh, you, you know, ask uh, all of you to, uh, to please uh, support us and, and support the, uh, the Kickstarter. Uh, in addition to, you know, all the cool feelies and, you know, being among the first people to play the game and you know, all of that. There, there's, there's a couple, a couple of, of key reasons that I, I'd like to put out there in, in that request for support. Um, the more people who back the uh, Nox or Chaos campaign, um, I, I think the more encor- encouragement it may provide uh, to others who develop Apple II games in general and large-scale RPGs in, in particular, because there are an enormous amount of work. Any Apple II game, and especially a large-scale, you know, eight-disc side RPG uh, like, like what Nox or Chaos is going to be. And, uh, you know, we'd like to see more of them. I had a great chat with uh, Martin Hay of Law- the Lawless Legends team at Kansas Fest uh, this year, uh, you know, where we both expressed our hope that, uh, you know, our projects would inspire uh, others because, uh, among other reasons, you know, 
you know, we want to see the uh, the Apple II community grow, and because we'd like to play some Apple II RPGs that we don't know the ending to. So <laughs> there's, uh, uh, you know, a couple, couple facets to that. Um, and then additionally, uh, here, here's, here's, you know, one, one other, you know, thought uh, that I like to leave everyone with as far as, you know, uh, why do Max Knox are chaos? Well, um, Unknown Realm launched a Kickstarter for the Commodore 64 in January 2017. It was an unprecedented success in the retro gaming world, receiving over a thousand backers. And, uh, you know, we in the Apple II community, of course, don't want to be shown up by the Commodore 64 stones. So, you know, come on, we got we to gotta band together on this. <laughs> All right, Mark. Well, I think I'm going to go off right now and I'm going to go buy myself a village and name it after myself. Well, well thank you very much for your support and, and thanks for having me on the show Excellent. Today. Well, thanks so much, Mark, and best of luck with the Kickstarter. Thank you.